At the end of the last video, we asked ourselves, is this doable when n isn't prime? For instance, if n is 4. Let's try to do the same as we did with 3. So my numbers should now be 0, 1, 2, and 3. Let's take a 4x4 four four array. And let's just make a really simple line generated from this arrow. This arrow can be described by the pair 1, 0. I then scale this with all my numbers to get these four points forming this line. No issues so far. Now, if everything is in order, we could have started with this arrow instead, which is described by 2, 0. Now, if n is 4, 2 times 2 will be 0, and 2 times 3 will be 2. So scaling gives these points, and only these points. So this line somehow misses out on half the points. It's not the same line as the one before. And this is a big problem because it violates our second rule. We suddenly have a pair of points with two different lines going through them. But it's actually even worse than that. If 2 times 2 is 0, then dividing by 2, 0 divided by 2 is 2. But of course, 0 times 2 is 0. So again, dividing by 2, I get 0 divided by 2 is 0. So 2 equals 0. Well, no. The root of all this evil is that crucial property we mentioned before. Remember that when n is prime, I can take any non-zero number available, multiply by everything, and I get everything back. Whereas here, we don't. Okay, so is it impossible when n is 4? Well, it turns out it isn't. In fact, it's possible whenever n is a prime power. What's a prime power? Well, this just means that n is equal to a prime number elevated to a whole number power. For instance, n could be 9 because 9 is 3 squared and 3 is prime. Or it'll work if n is 64 because 64 is 2 to the power 6 and 2 is prime. Or n could be 2 trillion 15 billion 993 million 900 thousand 449 because that is 17 to the power 10 and 17 is prime. Or just 4, which is 2 to the 2. We're going to take note of this base prime number, in other words, p, which in this case is 2 if we want n to be 4. We'll use this number p, just as we used n before, to lay out our whole numbers. If p is 2, wrapping the number line around 2 means the only regular numbers are 0 and 1. What happens to the circular arithmetic? Well, it's extremely simple. 1 plus 1 goes back to 0, which means going backwards from 0 tells us minus 1 is the same as 1, which means minuses are the same as pluses. But that's not enough, right? We want n equals 4, not n equals 2. And we can't take the numbers 2 and 3 because that didn't work. Here's what we'll do. We're going to create a new number. And to neaten what follows, I'm going to call it alpha, the Greek letter. This mysterious number is not a whole number. It lives elsewhere. So what we have so far are a 0, a 1, and this mysterious alpha. And these are our numbers. Now immediately here, because I have both a 1 and an alpha, I can add them together to produce yet another number, alpha plus 1. Adding things has been perfectly legal so far, right? So by adding this new number alpha, I will automatically get at least four numbers, 0, 1, alpha, and alpha plus 1. And I can't really go further in terms of adding, because 2 of anything is just 0. I will relabel alpha plus 1 as beta, the next Greek letter, just as in everyday life you would relabel 7 plus 1 as 8. But remember that beta is one step above alpha, and this is only to keep things neat. So you're probably wondering how any of this is useful. I've just written a 0 and a 1 and put two random Greek letters down. And you're right, for this to be useful, we actually need to say what alpha is or does. We're going to say that alpha is any number which, when multiplied by the number 1 up, which we called beta, gives 1. The motivation for this will become clearer as we go along. But I'd like to stress that the actual value of this number isn't important. It's what it does. I promise you this isn't cheating, as you will see. Right, so let's fiddle with this and see what more we can say. Well, if alpha plus 1 is beta, then if I add 1 onto both, I get the following. But those two 1s, well, they add to 2, and 2 here is 0, so this side is just alpha. So somehow, going 1 up from beta brings us back to alpha. But in some sense, that isn't hugely surprising. Our first idea was to take a circle with 4 points, but now instead we have two separate circles with two numbers on each we have one final thing to try, and that's multiplication. So if I go back to writing beta's alpha plus 1 again, then this says alpha lots of alpha plus 1 is 1, which is the same as saying alpha lots of alpha, so alpha squared, plus alpha lots of 1, so just alpha, add to 1. So this here is just another way of wording my requirement for alpha. I've just written alpha times beta equals 1 in a slightly different way. Okay, so what more can we do? Well, Add another alpha to both sides, and then we get the following. 
on one hand this 1 plus alpha, well that's 1 up from alpha, so that's just beta, and this here, well that's twice alpha. But remember that in this world, 2 is equivalent to 0 because my only regular numbers are 0 and 1. So this disappears and we're left with alpha squared equals beta. Squaring this number we created just takes us one step up. I will record that. But because alpha and beta are symmetric, if squaring one gives the other, then squaring the other must return us to the first. So we can directly deduce that beta squared must be alpha. This means that just using 0, 1, alpha and beta, we can't make anything new. No matter what multiplication or addition we try, we always return to one of these four numbers. But it's even better than that. If I take a non-zero number like alpha, and I multiply by everything else, I get everything back. And the same for beta. And of course the same for 1. So we have four numbers, and they work in the correct way. They're not all whole numbers, but that doesn't matter. It's the interactions, the structure, that matters. Let's draw some lines. I'll use this arrangement so that it looks like the previous one, but remember that alpha and beta are not 2 and 3, despite the suggestive positions I've given them. Take that problematic arrow we tried before. We can write this as alpha to the right and 0 up. Now if I scale that alpha, as we just saw, I get all numbers back. And of course this line has slope 0. So we get the full line, the same line as if we took the smaller arrow from 0 to 1. And so everything works well. Let's try one more line to illustrate why this is not quite as obvious as when n is prime. This arrow can be expressed by 1 alpha. Scaling by 0 or 1 is easy. When I scale by alpha, we get alpha beta, because remember that alpha times alpha is beta. And when we scale by beta, we get beta 1, because beta times alpha is, by definition, 1. And it turns out this line has slope alpha, though that is not quite as obvious as it may seem. Now, if we tried to trace, we might find this strange shape. And unfortunately, this is because there isn't an easy and nice way to make visual sense of these non-prime cases in this simple square setup. But remember, lines here are just finite collection of points, and you can create them by just scaling the numbers. And that's all you need to think about, really. So as you can see, mathematically, n being 4 is considerably harder than when n is 7, for instance, even though it's a smaller number. How does this work in general, though? To answer this, I'd like to quickly rewrite the condition on alpha once more. We got alpha by saying, take a number which, when multiplied by itself plus 1, which we call beta, is equal to 1. Then we said, that's the same as asking alpha squared plus alpha equals 1. We're going to fiddle with this for the very last time by adding 1 to both sides. Well, the right-hand side, now we just have 2, and that's the same as 0. This expression on the left is what we call a polynomial. These turn out to be the key ingredient in these constructions. So what exactly is a polynomial? A polynomial is made by choosing a symbol. It's common to choose a capital X in this context. You don't need to imagine this as a variable or an unknown to be found. It's just a symbol. Side point, this is why some authors avoid using a lowercase x in this context, which is commonly used to indicate a variable in maths. Then we say, I'd like to take that symbol and put some whole number powers on it. And then we say I'd like a certain amount of each of these objects. I've written down whole numbers for these, but they really can be any numbers that are legal in the world you're working in. We usually erase anything we want zero of, and then we just add these together. And that's what a polynomial is. For things to the power 1, we usually omit the 1, and because things to the power 0 are equal to 1, we usually omit the x to the power 0. These blue numbers are called coefficients. And because mathematicians are lazy, usually coefficients of 1 are not written. It's assumed that you have 1 of something unless you are told otherwise. The highest power in the polynomial, in this case it's 5, is called the degree of the polynomial. So why are polynomials useful here? Well, given a polynomial we can do something really clever. We can say, let's pretend this whole thing is equivalent to the number 0. Now that might sound like outrageous nonsense, but let's just remember what we've been doing this entire time. We took the number line we all know and love, and selected a prime number and said, I want that number to be 0. And that turned out to be a really good decision, because it gave rise to all of those interesting configurations. The only leap forward here is we're adding one new symbol. We then allow it to do its thing, and then instead of picking a regular whole number, we pick one of these, and we say, I want that thing to be 0. So for instance, with our delightful n equals 4 case, we were actually taking the polynomial x squared plus x plus 1 as our 0. 
I chose to relabel the x and x plus 1 as alpha and beta to make things a little nicer to write, but the principle is identical. This polynomial stuff may seem a little abstract, but if you made a card game for n equals 4, so with 5 symbols per card, without any maths knowledge at all, you would have implicitly used this polynomial yourself without realizing. Okay, that's all fine to say, but from a mathematical point of view, how do we create the right polynomial in the first place? How do we come up with x squared plus x plus 1, knowing it'll work for n equals 4? If you choose n to be a moderately sized number, some sort of method is necessary. This turns out to be a trickier question, but I will talk about it a little. What went wrong with our first attempt at n equals 4 is we had non-zero numbers multiplying to 0. We made 4 to be 0, but we could still split up 4 into two smaller non-zero things. And this is what was nice about prime numbers, you can't break them down. This means that when we make our polynomial equivalent to 0, we don't want to be able to split it up into two polynomials of lesser degree, because then we would have two non-zero things multiplying to 0. So what we need are polynomials that can't be broken up. And the term for a polynomial like this is irreducible, or sometimes prime, just like regular numbers. Now, there is a drawback here, and that's that breaking down polynomials has subtleties. Whether something is irreducible or not depends on what coefficients we allow. What do I mean by that? Well, take the polynomial x squared minus 7, for instance. Now, if I allow all the positive and negative numbers you can think of and encounter in school, for instance 1 pi minus 4, the square root of 7, and so on, then this polynomial is not irreducible, because with a bit of high school algebra, we can write it like this. And those two things are perfectly valid polynomials because I've allowed coefficients like the square root of 7 or minus the square root of 7. However, if I only allow the numbers between 0 and 10, for instance, a world in which 11 is equivalent to 0, then this polynomial is irreducible, because we can't break it down if I'm only allowed to use those numbers. But if I then, for instance, replace that minus with a plus, then it no longer is irreducible on the right-hand side, and that's because I can break it down likewise. Try doing the algebra if you are not convinced, bearing in mind that 11 is equivalent to 0. However, back at all the positives and negatives, it now is irreducible, because you can't break it up. But then if I add a couple things on the right-hand side, for instance treating 13 as 0 instead, then it'll also be irreducible there. So the bottom line is that it depends on your point of view. So the question is, how do we select the right irreducible polynomial in the first place? Well, the number n will tell us. In fact, that prime number base is going to tell us what the legal coefficients are. We wrap the number line around to make that prime number equivalent to zero, just like when we started out. All the coefficients of the polynomial must come from that set of numbers, and the polynomial needs to be irreducible from that point of view. The power, on the other hand, labeled k, will tell us what the degree of the polynomial should be. Now it turns out a polynomial like this always exists, for any prime you like, and any k you like and that making it equivalent to zero will give us the structure of things that interact in exactly the way we want. An explanation for that is out of the scope of this video, but maths tells us that these always exist and there are techniques for finding them. So for instance, if n were 7 cubed, in other words 343, we'd need to search for an irreducible polynomial with coefficients between 0 and 6 and with an x cubed but nothing higher. For instance, it turns out x cubed plus 2 is one such polynomial. Or if n were 4, as before, we only need zeros and ones and a maximum of x squared, which agrees with our previous example. Here's a more concrete example with n being 8. Well, it turns out x cubed plus x plus 1 is an irreducible polynomial. Coefficients are zeros and ones, degree is 3, and it is irreducible, so we'd hope to get our 8 elements. Just as before, we figure out all the numbers we can make using addition and multiplication from the 0, 1, and x, and then the resulting set will exactly be a collection of eight things which interact in that crucial way we outlined before. This might be a little hard to see if you have very little maths background, but I'd like to briefly demystify the reasons behind choosing the prime to tell us the coefficients and using the power to specify the degree. Observe in this example that if x cubed plus x plus 1 equals 0, then the powers of x that appear in all the resulting numbers must be less than 3, meaning they will look like some amount of x squared, some amount of x, and some amount of 1. This is because if I rearrange the condition by minusing x plus 1, remember that in this particular case minuses are the same as pluses, then anything with a power of 3 or higher breaks down into things of lower power. So then we can easily find all the elements. The coefficients are allowed to be 0 and 1, 
So just writing down all possible ways of putting these into the ABC slots will generate all the numbers we were looking for. So the power provided the degrees of freedom, whereas the base gave us the number of choices in each of those slots, which means the total number of elements is the number of choices to the power of the degree of freedom. And that's how the polynomial relates to the number of things that come out of the construction. So prime powers are good, but what if n isn't a prime power? Well, to answer that question, we need to think about fields. And by fields, I mean mathematical fields. Those microcosms that had a specific type of arithmetic in them, which we used to generate points and lines, they are something called fields in maths. Fields can be many things, but we were looking at finite ones. We saw that when we want a prime number of elements, it's easy, but for more complicated prime powers, it's a bit harder, but still possible. The point is, once we have a field, we can make a game like Dobble, as seen previously. So the question is, can we make a field when n isn't a prime power? Well, surprisingly, it turns out, no. If you ask for a field, you're only going to get something with a prime power amount of elements. Let's see why this is. To do this, we really need to make precise what a finite field is. Well, it consists of a number of abstract things, elements, which behave in a certain way. To start, we need to be able to add any two elements, and this could even be the same element twice, and the result must always equal something else in the field. There also needs to be some element which plays the role of zero, which when added to anything, gives the same thing back. Furthermore, for any element I choose, there always should be exactly one element I can add that cancels it out. With numbers, this would be like asking for negative numbers so that we can cancel the positives. In other words, this allows subtraction. But we don't want just addition and subtraction. We also want multiplication. And just like with addition, whenever I multiply two things, I want the result to be something from the field. And just like addition, I want something that doesn't affect multiplication, something that plays the role of one. When I multiply anything by this element, it doesn't change. Again, much like with addition, given any element, I want there to be exactly one element, which multiplies it to give one. This essentially allows division. And one final point, when I multiply by zero, I always want to get zero. And that's pretty much what a finite field is. You've probably come across fields before. For instance, the rational numbers, meaning all valid fractions of integers, form a field. Or for instance, the real numbers, which we sometimes imagine as a continuous line, along which every positive and negative number you can think of exists. Those also form a field. So bearing in mind what a field is, let's have a look at a second type of structure. These are called vector spaces. And much like a field, a vector space is a collection of things with a certain structure. The elements in a vector space, we call them vectors. If you've done a bit of high school maths, you probably think of vectors as things with coordinates, much like the arrows from before. But those are just an example of a vector. Vectors can be numbers, or sequences, or even polynomials, and many other things. A vector is just something inside a vector space and nothing more. So what is a vector space? Well, like fields, in a vector space, we are allowed to add vectors together. And we always want the result to be another vector in the space. Also, like before, there needs to be a vector that plays the role of zero, meaning that when I add it to a vector, I get that vector back. However, unlike before, vectors cannot be multiplied together. A vector space does things slightly differently. It uses the ingredients from a predetermined field to make a form of multiplication happen. We can take any element from that field and multiply a vector by that element, and again, we want the result to still remain in the space. In this context, the elements of the field are called scalars. This is because whilst we maybe can't multiply vectors by themselves, a vector space allows us to scale the vectors by stuff in the neighboring field. The next things should feel natural. If we scale a vector by the one element, the result shouldn't change. If we scale a vector by the zero element, well naturally we should get the zero vector. And that pretty much makes up a vector space. Now, absorb those notions and let's look at those finite fields to see what's happening. Let's try to stay really general and say our field has n elements. And let's take the element that plays the role of 1. Now, to make things nice to read, I am going to write this element as the number 1 instead. This is just some relabeling. So what can I do with this element? Well, I can add it to itself, right? Fields allow us to do that. And then I could add 1 to that. And I could add 1 again, 
and I can keep going, revealing a new element each time. But hold on, this field is finite, so this can't go on forever, otherwise we would have produced infinitely many elements. So this must end somewhere and come back to zero. That's the only way this one element can be stopped from otherwise creating infinitely many elements. The number of ones we added is called the characteristic of the field. The characteristic is the smallest amount of ones you need to add together to get zero. For our field, let's write this number as p. We can straight off make an astute observation. This number p has to be prime. Now, why is that? Well, let's write p as the product of two numbers a and b. Inside the field, p is equivalent to zero. So we have two numbers, each between zero and p, and they multiply to zero inside the field. But in a field, the only things that multiply to zero are things equivalent to zero. Neither of them can actually be zero in the real world, because a times b is p, so one of them must be p and the other must be one. This shows we can't break down p without running into contradictions, and so the characteristic of a finite field must be a prime number. Time for some quick labeling. In our field, we have a zero and a one. But as we saw, there's also this one plus one element. And if it's different, we can label that one plus one element as two. And then there's this one plus one plus one element. And why not call that three? And then this element here, let's call that four. And so on, till we add together p minus one ones, which we can just call p minus one. So in any field with characteristic p, there is always a collection of elements that pretty much look like the numbers between 0 and p minus 1. So now let's come back to the full thing, having relabeled some of the elements to reflect what we just figured out. Okay, but hang on. Remember that those elements on their own, they're also a field. A smaller field consisting of just the numbers between 0 and p minus 1, just like in all our cases when n was prime. So inside our field lives a smaller field. Now, to refresh our memory, we can add any two things to get something else, right? And we have our zero, and we can also multiply any two things together to get something else. Well, what does that sound like? That means this is a vector space. The things on the right, we're allowed to scale them using elements from a field. We can also add any two of them together, and there's a zero. So whilst this thing is a field, it can also be viewed as a vector space if we think about it slightly differently and forget the ability to multiply anything we wish. Why is this useful? Well, vector spaces have something we call bases. A basis is a finite collection of vectors from the space that can be used to express anything else in the space by scaling the vectors separately and then adding it all together. Kind of like having a set of primary colors with which you can express any amount of any other color by taking a certain amount of each and mixing them together. Then by doing all possible scalings, you would produce all the things in the vector space using only the elements of the basis. Like you'd make all possible colors in all possible amounts using your primary colors. On top of this, we can't drop something from the basis without then missing out on certain elements of the vector space. Just like you couldn't drop the color blue and still make purple with red and green. A basis is as condensed as it could possibly be. This allows us to count everything in this space. Let's say the basis has k elements. In a vector space, all bases must have the same size, so it's okay to say this. In this picture, it's four. How many choices do we have for scaling the first basis vector? Well, p, because that's how many things are in the neighboring field. What about the second basis vector? Again, p possibilities. And again, and again. How many vectors does this produce? Well, p times p times p, etc. In total, k times. In this picture, it would just be four times. And what's a different way of writing that? p to the power k. There are p to the power k things in this space, which was the field we started out with. See, what we've done is we took a random field with n elements, and using clever reasoning, we showed that this number must be some sort of prime power. The prime is whatever the characteristic of the field is, and k is however many elements must go into a basis if the field is viewed as a vector space instead. There cannot be a finite field that has size that isn't a prime power, and therefore the methods we've been using will only apply when n is such a number. You may have noticed a connection between this and the polynomial stuff, namely that counting elements using the basis idea looks an awful lot like when we counted elements using the polynomial coefficients. And if you did notice that, then well done, because that is precisely what we were doing. So the question is, are there other methods? Ways of making projective planes but not through fields.
Well, it turns out we only have very few examples, and all of those constructions are for n being equal to 9, which remains a prime power. So this leads us back to what if n isn't a prime power? Is there another mystery way of getting projective planes when n isn't a prime power? Perhaps not using our clever and powerful field construction, but some other method. The answer is we only know a couple things. We know for sure that if n is either 1 or 2 more than a multiple of 4, then it has to be equal to the sum of two square numbers to have a chance at producing a projective plane. This result was shown in 1949 by Richard Brooke and Herbert Reiser. For instance, n couldn't possibly be 6 or 14 because they are 2 more than a multiple of 4 but cannot be written as the sum of two squares. This means, for instance, that it is impossible to construct a dull type game in the sense we've described with 7 symbols on every card. You might ask how this ties into the prime power stuff, and it turns out prime powers of this form can always be written as sums of two squares. This is a neat little result from number theory. For instance, here are some prime powers written as 1 or 2 plus a multiple of 4, but also written as the sum of two squares. This can be done for all prime powers of this type, so there are no issues there. So what does that mean for 10? 10 is 2 up from a multiple of 4, and is the sum of two squares 1 and 9, so does it work for 10? It turns out it doesn't. And this was shown in 1989 by three computer scientists whose names I've written down and it took enormous computer power to do it. In fact, it was estimated between 2,000 and 3,000 hours of program runtime spread across two full years for the answer to come out. So what about something like 12? We don't know. You would make mathematical history if you managed to create a complete double type game in the sense we've described where there are 13 symbols on every card. I don't suggest you try as the evidence suggests this isn't possible. In fact, we don't have any examples for anything other than prime powers. This is an open problem in mathematics, and some mathematicians are working hard on cracking it. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learnt something interesting from it. Thank you for watching.